All right, guys. Um, got some stomach stuff going on. Don't really know what it is. Karina and I both have it. Basically, I don't feel like I have gas. Jeez, this is just what a way to start this fucking thing off. But my stomach feels bloated and painful, um, and I've been getting nausea. And I like being a junkie for as long as I've been. I don't even like not. I like enjoy nausea. Like if I don't get nauseous when I do drugs, I'm like Phew, whack. This fucking sucks. I want to feel like shit right now. And most people that do drugs like to feel nauseous. Well, at least opiate addicts. So I've never been one to complain if I if I get nauseous. But you know, I woke up last night. We watched a movie. I never get to spend time with Kareem anymore. Watched a movie. Went to sleep early. I don't know, probably like at midnight, which for me is, is pretty rare. I'm trying to get on like a better sleep schedule. I feel like I can get more done content-wise, writing-wise. There's a lot of time that I waste by sleeping because my sleep schedule's off. And basically, I think the biggest thing that takes up time for me is being on the phone. I have to be on the phone all the time with different projects that I'm trying to do because that's what I ultimately want to do. I want to to get all this other stuff off the ground. We got the horror movie going into production in January. It's pretty low budget for, you know, considering. But this new one with Nick, it's looking like that's going to be like a real movie. We have meetings lined up with some pretty big dog people. I'll post pictures. Um as they come in over the next couple weeks. But uh, I mean, we could have a deal probably next week, I'd imagine. And I'm hoping that that happens before Christmas. That would make a great Christmas. And then of course the documentary, and I worked on that a lot yesterday as well um, in the day. So we're just about up at to, to an hour cut to show you guys. Um, and then, you know, it'll just keep trickling in as it has been. It's just, it's taken a hell of a fucking lot longer um, than I could have ever anticipated, but it's interesting because what you guys have seen, the 37 minute rough cut, that, like that's the beginning and the film just gets so much more, di it just gets so much, um, now why does that sound right? Am I like trying to say it out loud? It's, it, it becomes so much more, does that sound right? More different? Differenter? It just gets differenter. It has differenters. It gets a lot more different. It just doesn't sound fucking right. I don't know. It changes rhythm, I guess, by, you know, from what you guys have seen, it's more of like a conventional doc, and then it gets more into the, like, cinema verite, which is the footage, like, speaks for itself, and really, like, the rest of the film is like that, then towards the end, it kind of picks up back where the beginning uh, left off. It's kind of, I don't know, unique structure. You know, most documentaries have, like, a pretty uniform you know, set of dynamics in how it operates. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's been a challenge to do that. But I woke up this morning <clears throat> and first off, like I woke up feeling feverish. I don't think I had a fever. I just felt like shit. Like I had a headache, smoked weed last night. I'm not smoking as much as I was. And I'm really trying to like get completely sober again. Just, I don't know. I mean, I look back at the completely sober version of myself and although weed honest to god it really helps with my mental health stuff because i'm i'm crazy i mean that's it's fucking true you know for a long time i tried to like my parents would be like god you're not crazy and i'd be like yeah i'm not yeah just going through a phase then i'm like 33 I'm like yeah dad i got arrested for pimping again he's like fuck you're not crazy you're not bad i'm like yeah yeah i'm not and then now i'm kind of like eh, maybe i am Having a kid certainly, you know, got me um, more anchored, you know. Not to say that I wasn't doing drugs when he, you know, it's like, I thought that having a kid, I'd be like, drugs? No way, man. I'm, I'm, I'm not that selfish, but, but I guess I am. I guess maybe I'm just a piece of shit. I don't even think that. I think I'm just, I think I just am a drug addict. And, you know, I wish that a child would instantly make 20 years of being a drug addict just go away because now you have a reason to behave yourself 
It's not even behaving, you know. Uh, I don't have fun when I use drugs anymore. I'm simply self-medicating. Uh, I don't do a lot of drugs these days. I do Molly. I'll say that. So what? You know, I do. Not like every day. I'm like driving, getting my dick sucked, rolling. I'm like, fuck, this, this Molly's bomb, babe. She's like, I oh, know. It's not, not like that. Uh, we do do it on like special occasions. And obviously when our child isn't around. Uh, and I smoke weed, but I don't, I don't no, I don't consider that a drug, but I would like to get to the place where I'm not doing any of that. So, I kind of felt feverish, and then I puked, like, five times. I was talking to Nick on the phone, and I kept puking. He's like, are you using? I'm like, no, I'm just puking. He's like, you're using. I'm like, no, I'm not. Hello? And then, like, I hear Karina, like, shout from upstairs. She's like, are you using? Nick texted me and said you're using. I'm like, oh. God, Jesus Christ. No, I'm not. Uh, but I puked. That's weird. I don't know. I don't usually puke. Um, Karina, I will say, has similar symptoms. She's feeling kind of a stomach bug. So maybe that's what it is. I don't know. So then I slept the rest of the day and I woke up hour ago. I don't know. Once in a while I like wake up and like tweet, fuck ever heard. And then like go back to sleep. All right. So, uh, so sorry about that. But, you know, I I'm up now. And, uh, and so now here I am. So let's get into the story. So where we had left off last time, and I guess this is the base storyline. I put up, um, a wasting talent video yesterday for the $10 tier and a $20 tier gets, uh, some of those other storylines that keeps going. And then this will be the base one for the $3 tier. And I already, I'm not even doing anything for YouTube right now. I need to get back to that because I feel bad for people that have supported me on that platform. And they're like, you're a sellout. And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, sucks posting shit. And then you're like taking a shit and you get, you know, someone's like, you're a bad father. And you're like, you're like straining while you're shitting. You're like, fuck, am I? I don't know. It's not shit you want to like read all the time. And then people be like, you're too sensitive. You're a bitch. And I'm like, I say that all the time. I am overly sensitive. I am a bitch. Don't say you're a bitch, bitch. You know, people are just so weird. It's like, I'm fucking joking. I don't think I'm a bitch. I've put food on the table for my family every day. That is the antithesis of being a bitch. You know, being a bitch is not being a good father. You know, not being a faithful partner to your partner. If it's a dude. That's being solid. That's not being a bitch. Okay, let's get into the story. So where we had left off last time in the Redux series, which I guess is more... Oh, and I'm going to get back into Wasco as well. Um, no, I don't know. It's You guys will appreciate when those videos do come up because it's been a while, you know? And I'm not going to spend time recapping it. Maybe I'll recap it in the, in the, um, in the description so that nobody can be like, yeah, this is fucking four minutes of recap, you piece of shit. Fucking cheater. I'm like, hmm. sorry. I'll not do four minutes of recap, but... I'll do, let me do a couple minutes of recap. Uh, where we had left off last time, where we are on the storyline. Um, so things had kind of shifted for me um, right around, like, I'd blown the Cop Busters money or a contract. I mean, I had a deal on the table. $400,000. That's the second time that I've blown it. <laughs> Two times the same amount of money. I blew another $400,000 contract in 2017 for the life rights, for the Mike Virgin story. And I didn't do it. Because if I had done that, I'd never be able to use that story for anything. I wouldn't even be able to, like, post videos about that story. I wouldn't be able to write the screenplay. I just wrote about it. Uh, so I didn't do it. But the Cop Busters era, um, I had blown that contract. And at a certain point, I'd stop smoking crack. You know, um, when I'd drink in the shampoo bottle. Around that time... One thing that was interesting that had happened was um, I'd met this guy, Happy. Not his real name. Um, what did I say his girlfriend's name was? Amy? Her real name was Amanda. Well, if you don't know both of their names, it doesn't matter. But, okay. So, I started hanging out with this glass blower guy. Now, that guy introduced me to, like, a, you know... A, a higher class of people, 
And it's really shitty to even look at people like that. At least these people thought they were higher class. Let's, let's just put it that way. Like, what do you do? I do photography. I'm like, really? Do you do shows? He's like, no. Just for men's ski catalogs. I'm like, oh. Dope. He's like, yeah. It's pretty dope. But then there was like a bunch of, you know, there, a lot of, a lot of actors, a lot of actresses. And that's where I first met film industry people. This guy would have these crazy kind of, you know, parties at his, at his house. And why was he plugged up with those guys? I don't really know. I don't even know where he was from originally, somewhere on the East Coast, I think New York. I think he was from New York. And he had become a world famous glass blower. You know what really sucks about these stories is that I make up the names of people and then I can't fucking remember what I call people. And that must be confusing if you're following along. I know Sass, that's not his real name, and I've slipped and said that fucker's real name a few times and I think he watches my Patreon. But, um, god damn, man. I cannot remember, um, what I call, anyway, well, doesn't matter, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Um, the reason I think that he had that, those kind of people at his house was because, first of all, he had a fat house. And Santa Barbara, if you've never been there, is picturesque. You know, there's been soap operas named after it. It's like a really picturesque, picture-perfect beach town. It looks like a postcard. Um, contrary to popular belief, and people that are from there would never be like, chef, dude. They, you know, they'd be like, it's drugged out, it's crime infested. It's not at all. You know, I've lived in L.A. for a long, long time, and it's night and day. L.A. is is pretty wild. You see some crazy shit. You hear gunshots all the time. You see, you, you know, there's the ghetto birds, the ghetto choppers. They're the LAPD helicopters, and they'll just like, dude, I'll be like in my backyard, all meffed out, like beating off in my bushes. I, I, I have no idea why. I, mean, I could just be doing that in here. And then I'll, like, look up, and there'll be, like, a beam of light. And I'll just be like, busted, fuck. And I'll just, like, dive back into my house. That has never happened. But they do shine light um, when they're looking for somebody that's running. You know, you see it a lot on TV when there's, like, a high-speed chase. And then they have, like, the camera crew for the news. And they also have the LAPD, and they fly from helicopters above. So L.A. is kind of like a wild concrete jungle. It really is. Santa Barbara's not that way at all. But, of course... You know, people from any town get very insulated. You're like, dude, my town is, is wild. On the 16th of every month, they do a topless barbecue barbecue off. You know, people actually say stuff like that. You, you friends that in prison, these people in rural areas, they're like, yeah. Yeah, once in a while we do barbecues and the girls don't wear bikinis. I go. It's wild, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. What's up? I'm Samuel. Hey, Samuel. Nice to meet you. Yeah. I don't know where that came from. Okay, so, um, Santa Barbara, though, because of how nice it is, it attracts a lot of celebrities. There's a lot of film industry people there. Oprah Winfrey lives there. Michael Jordan lives there. Michael Jackson lived there. That's where he was mowing kids down. You know, like a Chomo, like a Willy Wonka fucking Chomo factory. Weird ass dude, huh? I had his attorney. Um, but, you know, it's like the kind of place where you walk around and you'll see famous people. You just will. You run into them. And it's like no big thing. It almost feels like you're on like an old Scooby-Doo episode. Remember when they used to have like guest stars? They're like, this week on Scooby-Doo, the Harlem Globetrotters. And it, like, shows a guy twirling a ball on his finger. Or, like, Batman and Robin. I always loved when Batman and Robin were on there. I was like, fuck yeah. Yeah. Probably isn't as cool now. But um, it's kind of how it was there. You'd always kind of run into people like that. So somebody like him, not only did he have a lot of money. Because when I met him, he had a shitload of money. This guy had, he was a glass blower, But he was also really plugged in, not only to kind of, like, the B-list acting world. Um, he was also plugged into high-end drug dealers, like SAS. That's how I met him. Remember when I told the story how I made a half a million dollars and I'd gone up to that mansion when I went to that Halloween party? 
when I was on acid and they basically recruited me to their house and I thought that they were trying to butt I seriously thought they were trying to do gay shit. And I was fucking like, I'm down. If there's money involved, I'm, I'm fucking with it. My girl's like, we don't need to do that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, though. If it comes to that, I'll fucking do anything. She's like, why? We're not even broke. Well, shut up. Don't kill it. Um, when we got to that house, I don't know if you remember the story, but... There was no furniture, and it was essentially full of... I don't know, there was a bunch of DVDs on the floor. Um, but they had a lot of glass pipes. Like, just a bunch of high-end bubblers, you know? I mean, nowadays, I smoke out of some straight bullshit, you know? This is my bubbler. You know, this is like a really dirty bubbler. Ew. Oh, Jesus Christ. It's like 50 bucks or something. I don't know. You know, and this guy would sell shit for like seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000 for a bubbler. And when I had gone to that house initially, they had these these big glass pieces scattered all throughout the, the house. Now, at the time, I didn't realize that that was that he had blown these pieces for him. And that's what this guy did. He would sit in his studio at his house. They had a pool. So they always had these pool parties. They had an outside fire pit. So it was really cool. Like you'd go over there, very drugged out atmosphere, cocaine everywhere, but also like weird drugs too, like non-social drugs. They're like, there's like a bunch of like Samoan guys, like with their shirt off. They're, um, they're like, yo man, do you want a line of roof and all? The date rape drug? They're like, yeah, we're snorting it to get heart palpitations. I'm like, mm, no. There were people doing obscure drugs. They're maybe not roofies, but, you know, ketamine, a lot of PCP, a lot of molly. Um, you know, it's almost like the environment there, aside from the cocaine and then later the heroin, was, um, you know, a lot. It was like, almost like being at an after party at a rave. Lots of, like, hot tan gay guys, like, rubbing Vicks Vapor Rub on their chest and, like, sniffing each other. Stuff like that. I was like, this shit's fucking bomb. Love it here. Never want to go home. And at that time, I started, you know, dating Jade. I mean, she was... I not about dating, but she was, like, my side bitch, right? And, uh, and then... We got in that situation, and now we get to the point where I don't know the girl's name. You go, this is all recap. No, it's not. It's too convoluted of a storyline for me not to remember all this, so I guess it is. I'm sorry. Um, this girl, I don't remember her name, but really quick, she was the girl, let's call her Sandy. She was the girl that nowadays is very wealthy. Baller for marijuana. She makes a lot of money. She, uh, you know, she... She's one of those people that was like one of the pioneers in the recreational or the medical marijuana community back when it was kind of like quasi legal. Like it was legal, but it like it wasn't. It was one of those. It was like a needle exchange kind of thing. And she just stuck, you know, stayed in the game. And now she's she's a baller. You know, she drives a Porsche and she's doing it. You know, and she's just always some stoner chick that like would wear sweatpants. And she was like. It was just like one of those girls that was almost like a homeboy, you know. Um, and she was dating this guy named Scott. Now, Scott was the guy that we had talked about in the video that came before this. He was a meth dealer, you know. And even different drug, you know, circle scenes that I've been in tend to look down on meth because meth's weird as fuck. Dudes will get spun out and be like, hey, man, I'm trying to suck your cock right now. And, you know kind of weirds people out sometimes. There's a lot of weird gay meth stuff. And I'm not against it. I mean, if I'm going to get my dick sucked, I'm just going to be honest. It's It's got to be from a woman. I'd probably do anything for like, for like 40 or 50 bucks though. But I've never been in that situation. Don't, don't get it twisted. I've never, I've always sold drugs. I don't know. That was always my hustle. But if I could have, you know, Probably would have. It just happened. No judgment to you junkies that have, because I'm, I'm with it. I know they get down. He ended up putting 
Sandy, and I know that's probably not the name I used last time, because that's not a real name. That's somebody I definitely want to protect her identity. Ended up putting her in the hospital. And if you remember, Kevin had been fucking Amanda behind Happy's back. That was a big deal. You know, that was controversial at that time because they'd been together like 20 years or some crazy shit. I don't know, 15 years. They were like high school sweethearts. Um, and they just been together forever. They're one of those couples that like people are jealous of, you know, they're like fucking bingo partners. I don't know if they do that, but those kind of people, you know, they do like couple shit. Like they have like pajamas with like, you know, matching embroidery. Like I'm with him, I'm with her, like t-shirts like that. Like they were like one of those annoying couples and they were one of those picture perfect couples that you would see from an outside perspective and you wouldn't think that anything was wrong and then of course they do ecstasy together and his dick winds up in her scooby-doo and the harlem globetrotters like solve the case too dude's just spinning the ball he's like hmm, i think it was the massage <clears throat> so by the time that sandy got beat up, went to the hospital, admitted to Amanda that she had gotten beat up by Scott. I took it upon myself to try to impress Jade. I thought, I'll kill him. And I came up with the whole plan, and see, now I'm trying to shorten the recap. It all comes to the moment where I end up going to the house because my plan was to block him in the driveway, go in there with this fake gun, and scare him. That was it. I had no, I was like, I didn't want to hurt him. Even though, look, I really did like this chick. She was my friend. You know, she'd been my friend since high school. Always like, you know, we, we weren't sexual, but like I'd wa I remember one time walking in on her getting boned and the guy had socks on and they were like little like snowmen logo socks, like these little shorts. And I was, it was so gross. She was like a good friend of mine. I just saw these balls and these snowmen socks but I just stood there sipping my beer. I was like, this is fucking disgusting. Gross. They're like, dude, can you shut the door? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that really happened. So I end up getting to this house. And of course, the plan was they were going to call me, let me know when he came. I think he was coming to deliver a quarter pound of meth. That's what... I'm pretty sure that it was something like that. I don't know. That's what this guy did. And this guy, by the way, Scott, was one of those guys that was always in and out of prison. Now, at that time, I wasn't always in and out of prison. I was always in and out of jail. But I, I wasn't a prison guy yet. He had, like, tattoos of, like, prison gun towers on his chest. I'm like, what's, is that so you don't forget that you're in prison? He's like, yeah, so. I'm like, all right. It's cool. Fuck yeah, man. Prison towers. Imagine telling the tattoo artist that. Yeah. I want you to blast some tattoo, uh, or I want you to blast some prison towers on my chest. You think that'd be dope? The tattoo artist is like, yeah, for sure. That's what kind of guy he was. And he's also the kind of guy that would do a term. And I know you, if you know convicts, you know people like this. He'd do a fucking term. The day he gets out, he already has a digital scale. He's already selling meth. And he's getting his dick sucked by hood rats. And, like, driving around listening to, like, music that's not popular anymore. He's like, yeah, dude, check out this corrupt album. Everyone's like, Phew. you know, I don't know. Probably was popular at, when, <laughs> at the time that I'm talking about this story. So then um, I show up at the house and I end up going in the backyard because the whole plan was to kind of intercept him in the front of the house. He never shows up. Nobody calls me, nothing. I mean, he's, you know, they called me and let me know that he was there. I pulled my car up. I had this fake gun. I blacked out the tip. And I just waited in my car for, for a while. I don't know, 45 minutes, something like that. So I end up going in the house. And they're all in the backyard. They're having this wild party. It's like shit you'd see in a movie. It's like, Chicks with big fake tits, like, playing volleyball. There's, like, not even a volleyball net. But they're just, like, you know, like, diving down and their boobs are flapping. 
and I just see him sitting in a chair. So I go up to him, put the gun up to to his face, and I start talking shit to him. Now, I, unbeknownst to me, this guy had pulled a gun out and put it on his lap, and he, like, kind of at first, I guess, acted scared. You know, that was at least... I don't... And I couldn't tell if, you know he knew that the gun was fake, but at, there was like a certain point where something clicked and his whole attitude had just completely shifted. And at this point, um, he just turned around and he started hitting a blunt. I was like, I have a gun to your fucking face, bitch. And he's just like, and then Amanda's like, I cheated on you happy with Kevin. Now Kevin was there. Now, you would think that, be, and sorry, 25 minutes in, I did a whole recap, but we still have half a video, so don't, don't worry, don't worry. You would think that this high stress situation, me pulling what looked like a gun out on Scott, would be like the main focal point. I swear to God, Kevin, or Happy and his girlfriend Amanda were so like such they're like the key the the king and queen the god damn they were the king and the king and queen of this scene so to hear something like that it was literally like in a movie when like the music like stops like you just hear like the scratch of a turntable and all of a sudden me pointing a gun at scott just became pretty unimportant and this guy happy was I don't know, he's like, I'm trying to think of like a way that you guys would understand what kind of guy he was. He was like, you know, the, he was like a Grateful Dead groupie guy. Curly hair, pothead, real like old school pot grower, outlaw manners. Everybody liked him. Personable, charismatic guy. Gregarious. Fucking lame word. He's gregarious. And he started crying. Now, I still have the gun pointed at Scott, mind you. Like, you would think that that would be like the... That would trump everything else. But he just starts... bawling in front of everybody. And I'm still pointing the gun at Scott. And he's like... And he, oh, and, um, and Happy was holding a Snapple. Remember Snapple drinks? And he fucking threw it at Amanda, and he hit her. And this is like after he's crying. So so she's like, I cheated on you with Kevin. And his face just completely changed. And he starts crying. He throws the Snapple at Amanda, and he hits her with it. You know, hits it in her shoulder. But, you know, a Snapple's like a thick glass drink. As soon as that happens, every, all eyes are already on them anyway. So now the entire party in the backyard just kind of erupts into chaos. And people go to, like, guys get up to go physically restrain him. Because it, he had the look of a madman in his, in his eyes. If you've ever been around somebody that has just found out that they've been cheated on, it's the mall massacre look. You know, they're just like... But he was crying, so his face crunched up, you know, scrunched up. And it looked, he looked really sad, and he took the snap, he took a sip of it, and he fucking chucked it at her, hit her in the shoulder. So now the whole place kind of like erupts and these guys spring up and they restrain him in the chaos. I'm still holding the gun. It's a plastic gun. It's a, and I have the real gun in the car, by the way. And I have Scott's car, you know, um, kind of blocked in. He can't leave. I, I, ha I have him blocked in. And that was like the whole point. I was going to embarrass him with the fake gun. And then, you know, I was going to look like I was a tough guy and then I was going to do my dick sucked by Jade and then I was going to cry on the way home because I'm a bitch and be like, oh my God, I cheated on Jenny for like the 30th time. No, I'd only done that a couple times at this point, but <laughs> at this point yeah, it happened. And you see videos of me um, from that period, you know, and some of the master clips from the documentary. I think those are on the upper tiers. But yeah, like I was in no sh shape or form to be with a 12 like that like i was like that all the time with acne and i like wore like wife beaters and i didn't i i like 
the only tattoo I had was like the fear and loathing, and I had like the sun. Junkie piece of shit. So in this chaos, everybody goes to stop happy because he had thrown this at, at Amanda. Scott somehow gets away because in my vantage, I'm not that far. I'm like, I don't know, maybe three feet from him, shaking this plastic, you know, air gun in his face or whatever. And in this whole party just goes up in flames. It just erupts. And people are holding um, Happy down. Everybody's uh, screaming. You know, Amanda's screaming, How could you hit me, you piece of shit? And Scott gets away. Okay, but, like I said, his car was blocked in. So, now, I'm wondering, because he's the kind of guy that always brag about, you know, busting caps and fools. He, like, went to private school. Uh, no, he didn't. He was one of the trashier people in Santa Barbara. You know, there are some trashy people there, but it's not... I mean, there's, like, trashy and, like a really trashy area, and then there's, like, you know, trashy in a beach town. You know, you're trashy, but you wear, like, you know, tongs and shit. You play ping pong. You know, that kind of trashy. So he gets away, and I'm thinking that he might go to his car and he might get a gun. You know, back then, even though I had a gun, even though there was that guy Andy that was around in the scene and he was selling guns... Other people had them as well. There weren't any shootings, but Scott was the kind of guy, if they're in, I don't trust people on crystal meth anyway. You know, they, you know, hallucinate that, you know, some bisexual ghost is like telling them to do stuff and then they just want to kill people or whatever the case. People go into weird meth psychosis, so they're very unstable. In the eye of the chaos, he ends up getting away and... I knew that I didn't have a real gun. So what I did is this house had like these like lemon trees, like on the side of it. It was like, I don't know, just a patch of them. But it was like the kind of area where you could hide, you know. I'd been on acid and, and, and like gone and hung out in these lemon trees. So as all this stuff's going on, Amanda's yelling, um, people are holding happy down. Kevin runs out of that party. He's gone. He's like, I'm out of here. I don't even know where he went. And I don't know where Scott went. I lost track of him. Like, people, you gotta, like, kind of visualize. People were, like, leaping up, getting in front of me. And he just took it as his cue to get out of there. In my mind, I'm thinking he's going to his car to get a gun. So I go to the lemon trees, and I kind of hang out there for quite a while. And I hate to admit this, but I was scared. You know, I was scared that he was going to retaliate in some in some way. So... I go hang out in these trees, I hide for a little bit, and he ends up, you know, getting away, I guess. Because when I ultimately come out, um, his car's still there because I had him blocked in. But he's no longer there, and there's really nobody there. Amanda's there, some of her girlfriends are there, and then, um, you know, Kevin's Kevin's gone. Um, and, and Happy's not there either. So I didn't know where anybody was. All I knew is that I had... Uh, What's sold out? You know, Karina just said, you sold out. No, don't start with that shit. I don't know, I just got some text message. So, like, you know, I go and I do my little ob obligatory, go up to Amanda. I'm like, hey, are you okay? And she's like, no. I'm like, well, why would you admit that you cheated on Happy at that moment when I'm pointing a gun at, at Scott? She's like, Everybody knew that that wasn't a real gun. And I guess, you know, she didn't tell me right there and then what her logic was behind that. But she did say that nobody thought that it was a real gun. Years later, if you guys remember, when I got married in the in the Doom Marriage series, when I ended up marrying my ex-wife, I had relapsed on heroin the night we got married. She was living in Denver and, you know, she had a, like a five-year-old kid out there. So after we got married, after our little fantasy of, of like meeting on the internet and marrying after a week, and then she's like, I'm a hooker. I'm like, what the fuck? She's like, I suck dick for Tylenol 3s. I'm like, you're gross. She's like, you're a drug addict. After all that stuff wore off, I had to go out to Denver 
and and uh, and live with her for a little bit because <clears throat> I was living on Jeff's couch at the time, and I wanted to go be with my chick. I'm codependent as fuck, and you know, I mean, I wanted to go be with her, and I did have feelings for her at that time, or at least I thought I did. And when I w ended up going out to Denver, I ran into Happy and Amanda. They they ended up staying together. They didn't break up because um, because Amanda had admitted to cheating on Happy. But when I had met them out there, they were holed up in a motel in Denver. Um, and I was strung out already when I went out there, and I didn't have any connections or anything. I didn't bring any dope with me. Luckily, I think the way that I had found them was I had put a post on Facebook and, you know, said that, you know, I was in Denver. Do I have any friends here? One of those kind of posts. And I think that's how I connected with them. They ended up reaching out to me and telling me that, you know, that they were out there. So when I had seen them, and this was, I married her in 2016. The story that I'm telling you guys right now probably took place in 2007. So I hadn't seen them in about nine years. Now, back in that time, when I was going over to their house and they were having those pool parties, um... They were smoking heroin off tinfoil. They were just getting into being drug addict or heroin addicts. You know, they're already druggies, but you know, again, I kind of polluted that scene. So I hadn't seen the last time I saw them, they were smoking heroin off tinfoil and their lives had already gone to shit. And we'll cover all that, um, in the course of this Redux series. But when I ended up seeing them in Denver, they were doing really bad. You know, they were living in one of those hotels that was like, you know, weekly, you pay for it weekly. It has like a kitchen in it and it's just really grimy. They were living in there. They had all this like mus musky, like old clothes and just smelled like stale cigarettes in there. And they both look like death. They were covered in track marks. Neither of them had veins anymore. They were both muscling their shots. So they would cook up shots and then they would just stick it in their ass cheeks their ass cheeks literally looked like like a statue that had damage on it. There was like chunks of their flesh of their asses missing. They had become IV heroin addicts and they just lived out there. And the thing that I never understood about them out there was, and, and I covered it in the do marriage, but basically they had like a weird connection, you know, some Pisces that they'd call. The phone number would open, I think it like... 10 in the morning, maybe nine in the morning or something, you'd put your order in and they tell you that you couldn't leave whatever address you gave them. You were literally calling like a, like a fucking call center for drug dealers. And then they would dispatch runners out to you to deliver the sack. So I'd always drop my wife off in Littleton, Colorado, the same place that Columbine had happened in 1999. And I'd drop her off there at work, and then I'd, she'd let me take her car. <laughs> I'd go out to their hotel, they'd put the order in, and then, like, you'd have to wait from, like, I think 10 to 1 in the afternoon at the, at the address or whatever. They wouldn't give you an exact time because they were trying to avoid getting set up by law enforcement. And it was just, like, the lifestyle that they were living was really miserable. I never understood where they were getting their money either. I mean, Happy gave me the story that he was basically getting paid to teach classes for glass blowing. He was a world renowned glass blower, but it just didn't seem like they'd be able to support that kind of habit. Living in a weekly motel by him, like giving lectures to glass blowers. To me, it just didn't seem like that could be that lucrative of a uh, industry anyway. So during that time, I mean, it was really sad. They would like just shoot heroin, be in this hotel, and they'd listen to celebrity or they'd watch celebrity rehab on TV. Not out. Occasionally, like, hey man, can you pass the ashtray? I'd be like, is this what you guys do every day? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, Phew. I think that she was probably prostituting herself. I don't want to put that out there, but that's what I think. So I guess I just did. That was my personal um, theory about where they were getting money. But anyway, the point of telling you all this is when we were out in Denver, nine years after the events that I'm talking about right now, 
we start having a conversation about this time period and about I never understood why when I had gone there to try to scare Scott and nobody knew that either like remember I was trying to I was trying to you know scare Scott so that I could impress that girl Jade that was like my whole purpose behind that but Amanda just admitted on cheating on happy right there and then and she had told me that because they knew that the gun was fake that um you know and scott had one in his lap and i was scared that he was going to go to his car and you know i felt like he struck me as the kind of guy that even if he had a gun which he had out on his lap when i had seen him he's the kind of guy that I just don't see having a loaded gun. And I thought that like, maybe he was going to go to his car and get bullets. And maybe that was just pr presumptuous of me. And I didn't know that, you know, that night I had no idea really what was going on. I just knew that it struck me as odd that he would pull it out and not use it. If there were actually bullets in there, he also struck me as the kind of idiot that would actually shoot me because he was like in meth psychosis. And what she told me is that, you know, and that was like my whole, that was like my whole logic at that point is that I thought that he was going to go to his car and grab the bullets or grab a real gun, or maybe that wasn't a real gun or whatever I thought he was going to do. I thought that somehow him going to his car was going to hurt me in some way. And what she told me is that they knew that he actually had a gun because there was a goddamn mule for him. There was somebody there that had already told them what the plan was, even though nobody knew that I had a fake gun, but they, I guess they could tell when I whipped it out on him. So by Amanda doing that, she actually kind of like jumped on the grenade for me. Her whole purpose of doing that was, was to, was to save me. Um, and my logic, like, you know, being okay, if he had a real gun, why would he just, you know, why would he, I thought, I thought that he didn't have bullets in it. And I thought that he would go to his car and get them. I don't know what I was thinking. I mean, I was all fucking drugged out back then. But basically, the, the point is, is that Amanda had admitted to me that day that the reason that she had told Happy that she cheated on him was to try to create chaos so that I could get out of there. Because she said that Scott actually had a loaded gun. That gun that he had actually was loaded, according to her. And I didn't find out until... I didn't find that out until nine years later. So me pulling out a fake gun on him could have cost me that, my life at that point. Not because he was a tough guy, just because he was meth psychosis enough to actually do it. And we started talking further all those years later when I was in Denver. And, you know, I brought up Kevin's name. And I never really knew how that whole situation played out. I mean, I knew them after that night, you know, and, I, and they, they ended up staying together. But he, she basically told me that they never bring Kevin's name up anymore and that that was the only time. By that point, that was nine years later, they'd been together who knows how long. Probably, I don't know, nine years more than... They'd already been together like 15 years or whatever it was. She said in all that time, she'd only seen him cry two different times. One time when his dog died and one time when Kevin had cheated on her. So... What ends up happening with Scott, that wasn't over with him. So he ends up getting away. I, I finally come out um, from that lemon tree area. And, you know, of course, like I said, I thought he was going to go to his car. And, and I thought that because he left that, I guess that's the what my logic was looking back on it. But Amanda was there and Happy had left. Kevin had left. I end up leaving. Now, remember, at this time, I'm still in debt with Sass. Stuff to work off that money. I got an opportunity right around then to um, to get a new house, and we were living in this like five bedroom that was kind of by the beach. That's the house that we were living at in all those old videos, and um, you know it just got hot. There was always people coming over there. That guy had OD'd there, so it got, it became time for us to get a new place. And we found the nicest house that I've ever had. It was in a place called Hidden Valley in Santa Barbara, which is kind of 
you know, the outskirts of a nice place called Hope Ranch. I don't remember what we were paying for this condo, but it was, I mean, it was like really, 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 it was like, even though it wasn't five, it was only two bedrooms, but it was the nicest place I've ever had. Like this place was, was just amazing. You know, it was in a cul-de-sac, you know, it had a, it had its own guest house. Like what fucking condo has its own guest house? Um, and in the guest house, the guest house was like outside by this outside parking garage. And we, we made a gym there, even though at that point I was on methadone and I was already gaining a lot of weight. I was like, fuck, I'm going to get a treadmill, try to shed some of these pounds. Um, around that time. So, okay. So I'm still owing SAS the money. And at this point, uh, I was like a full blown heroin dealer. So I was able to pay him off, you know, I've st or at least started paying him off. Remember, he's the guy that ended up jacking me for $70,000 and Jenny pistol whipped him and broke his jaw right before I went to the feds the for when I did the five years, but I was paying him off little by little. Now we had talked about in some of the earlier Redux videos, how I basically invented the new heroin marketplace. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody was used to doing Oxycontins, all that. Remember I said that we came in, we we're selling these balloons. They were going for like $25 to the runners. Runners were selling them for 50 or $60 a balloon. And that was such an effective marketing strategy that other drug dealers in Santa Barbara, like other wannabe me's, but not as cool. They had like their right ear pierced and they had like a cross dangling earring. You know, they had like, um, like just, I don't know, weird, like imitations of what I was doing. One of the guys that had done that was this guy, Steve. And we talked about him before. He was the guy that he had owned a pizza place in Santa Barbara. And he was also one of the co-owners of like one of the biggest medical marijuana dispensaries. This guy, Steve was a full blown crackhead, right? And I wasn't smoking crack now. Like I had stopped that. No, I was just focusing on selling heroin. I was like, I'm not a piece of shit. I'm just going to focus on selling heroin now. But I wasn't smoking crack, so I wasn't acting as erratic. Now, this guy, the reason I say that he was a piece of shit, not because he was a crackhead. I'm not going to say that because somebody's a crackhead, they're a piece of shit. Although, they're, that's often synonymous. Usually when you smoke crack, you do piece of shit things. This guy had an underage girlfriend. Now, we didn't know that at the time. He was probably like 24, 25. I was like... 22 at the time a few years older than me he always had a lot of guns at his house um and he had this girl with him now this girl was like you know she looked young but she could have been like 18 or 19 she had that kind of look she had colored hair like blue hair and he had her strung out on pcp she was like this guy's sex slave you know, and we come to find out later, much, much later after knowing this guy for a while, that she was a teenage runaway. She was from like the South or something. I think she's from like Alabama or um, Arkansas. She's from Arkansas, I think, if I remember correctly. I don't know. She was a teenage runaway. And this guy basically kept her strung out on PCP and would just do crazy shit. He'd be like, you want to run a train on this bitch with me? I'm like, your girlfriend? He's like, yeah. She likes getting spit roasted. I'm like, uh, no, nah, dude. I'm on methadone. I weigh like 230 pounds. I can't, I haven't shit for a month. And I don't even, I think I'm too constipated to shit even if I had a sex drive. You'd just like, be like, uh, uh. But this guy had this like little young girl strung out on, on PCP, you know? She didn't even know what she was like doing. He told her that it was DMT. He was like, yeah. It's like, this is DMT. It's a spiritual drug, but it was really PCP. And she became this like deranged, completely like disassociated, like sex slave to him. Point is, is he wanted to meet me. You know, I guess he had heard that I was selling a lot of weight in Santa Barbara at that time. He wanted to set up a meeting with me. And he had me come over to his pizza shop. Now, this is the same guy that later put a gun underneath the table and accused me of being a rat because one of my runners was dating one of my therapists at the methadone clinic. But that's down the line. First time I met him was at this pizza shop. He owned it. I forget what this pizza place was called, but 
It was right next door to this medical marijuana place. And they ended up getting busted for money laundering because this pizza place was, I don't know, essentially an under, you know, um, they weren't doing things on the books. You know, everything was kind of like sketchy there. And eventually they got this guy for money laundering. And I don't think they ever busted him for having the underage sex slave on PCP. That'd be cr quite the charge, though. What are you in here for? Uh, possession of an underage sex slave with intent to give her PCP for sexual um, enslavement. Oh, that sucks, man. I have one of those, too. You know, I don't know. It's not a charge, but... When I ended up meeting him, we met at this pizza place that he owned. And I went there... I forget who... Somebody... I don't know. We had a mutual friend. I mean... I was a heroin dealer at the time, he was a heroin dealer at the time, and he just, I guess, wanted to meet me because I was considered his competition or whatever. When I end up getting to this pizza place, I knew right away that he was a crackhead, just the way that he was acting. He's just like, he's like, hey man, I'm Steve. But like, he had his hair gelled, so it was like, eh, at least you're making an effort not to look like you're on crack. You know, because most crackheads don't even fuck with hair gel. This guy was like, he was like the Ace Ventura. He was like, hey, man. Do you smoke rocks? I was like, nah. Not anymore. So he introduces himself to me, and he basically tells me that the reason that he wanted to meet me was because he had just gotten arrested, I don't know, a couple weeks before this, and he had gone to Santa Barbara County Jail, and he said there was a guy in there named Scott, same guy that I'd pulled the fake gun out at Happy's party when Amanda had like jumped on the grenade for me. The same guy had to pull the gun out on me. And that he had met him in jail and then he was in there running his mouth about me. You know, and basically like, you know, yeah. He was at this pool party that I was at. I just fucked him up. Tied him up like a hog, homeboy. You know, like talking shit like that. And he was telling, I guess, a bunch of people in there that I was a big time dealer and that he wanted to, he wanted to rob me. And he was like seeing, like, he's just like, back then at Santa Barbara County Jail, they had what's called an honor farm. And, you know, I guess it was like for the better behaved inmates and you could actually smoke cigarettes on the honor farm. So they were all sitting out on this wooden table. God knows how many people he was saying this shit to, but he was basically explaining explaining that I had this house. Now, I'd already moved at this point. You know, I'd moved to this new house that I was just telling you about, but he knew where my old address was, and he was asking anybody if they wanted to help rob me with him. And uh, I guess this guy, Steve, who was the other heroin dealer, said that he was interested. And so they would, like, walk laps around the jail with these other two guys, these fucking idiots, and... They had guns, supposedly, and they were going to come rob my house. And Steve said that he respected me. He'd heard good things about me, whatever. I don't know, just some bullshit, some crackhead with hair gels telling me. And that he kind of played along with them, saying that, you know, he wanted to rob me, or he wanted to participate in the robbing, um, just so that he could get the intel and that he could present it to me and we could kind of, like, make some sort of pact. And he said that he would take care of the situation. I didn't know what that entailed. If I would let him in on the connection that I had down in LA because I was getting the multicolored balloons from the cartel down there. And what he was doing is he was buying black tar heroin. And this is how much he copied me. He put them in little aluminum, like, you know, little like ball, like they weren't balloons, but he made them look like aluminum balloons. They were like the terminate. They were like the Robocop of fucking heroin balloons. And then he would sell them for the same price. Like, he, he stole my business model. But, of course, I was making more money than him because I was fucking directly with the cartel. So I was getting way cheaper prices than he could possibly get. So that was his offer. You know, he said he basically had infiltrated this, like, group of these loser guys that were planning on robbing me. And that if I could cut him in, that he would take care of it. And I told him that I'd have to discuss it with Jenny because she was my business partner and that I'd get back to him. This led to a whole bunch of crazy shit, and we will get into all that. Because this is, there was another part of it that I didn't know that I'm about to find out that was attractive and taking care of the SAS situation. We'll get into all that in the next video. I have to take a shit.
Palabra.